Welcome to the Full FX Unfiltered. My name is Colin Lambert, publisher of the Full FX. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Alex Knight, who is head of EMEA and global sales at Baton Systems. Um, Alex, welcome. Thank you. The subject of FX post trade has just ballooned in terms of you know the uh, the column inches, should we say, that it that it takes these days. Um, I guess I'd like to start with a slightly sceptical note. Is the post trade and FX actually broken, or is this just another example of you know a solution looking for a problem? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Colin. And when we 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 come across this sort of thought process a lot actually when we're thinking about baton and we're thinking about the industry as a whole and i think you you know you know that i i spent 19 years at one of the large banks working sort of primarily in, in fx prime brokerage so i sort of had a real sort of first first hand view of this um and yeah the, the post trade issue the, there are big post trade issues in fx but across all, all of the markets businesses to be honest with you we've got legacy siloed yeah. batch based processes you know running on 24 hour cycles often um you can trade in as you well know from you know your your e-commerce sort of work you can trade in in nanoseconds uh have that trade booked have the risk managed um you know so from an excel spreadsheet perspective everything looks tickety-boo uh, straight off the bat and then it's like having the the guy stand behind the atm sort of finding the bundles of cash and passing them out through the through through the slot you know behind the scenes there's a world of pain yeah. yeah, and 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 that's what we see. And if you just put some numbers around it, you know, the the the, the very famous BIS survey around settlement risk, for example, you know, there's there's roughly nine trillion dollars a day of FX that is settled um, on a risky, let's call it risky bilateral yeah. basis, without without the sort of mitigants of PVP. Nine trillion dollars a day. You know what that is? That's twice the GDP of Japan every day. Yeah, being settled in that manner. And I think when you sort of put it in that context, you think, wow, that's that's huge. You think about about you know the, so the numbers that were produced in a re, in a report a little while ago um, around the costs of intraday funding for big banks. Yeah, big banks yeah. are spending, were spending, and it's I'm sure it's more now as, as sort of you know the, the buffers go up and the, and the costs of, of 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 funding go up. You know, big banks typically spend somewhere between 100 and 300 million dollars a year. On managing their intraday funding, and, yeah. and part of the reason they're spending that money is because the the post trade process, the settlement, the payment process is, is sort of so warped. You look at the collateral space; there's nearly just under a trillion dollars of you know cash and securities being held at CCPs, and you know big chunks of those are being moved every day, but they're being moved in a really suboptimal way. So. Does it work? Yeah, it's creaking at the seams, and it's just really suboptimal. So, so that's the that's really what we're focusing our attention on. Okay, so obviously, um, you know, Baton's core FX uh, solution for one is DLT based. How is that actually um, affecting change? You know, what what is Baton Systems doing to change this? So. Look, there are a few attributes, I guess, of, of distributed ledger technology that I think are really important, that really bring value. And sometimes people sort of kick off, and I'll kick off, but I think there's sort of the, the less important sides, you know, around, it, it, not not less important, but the, 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 you know, the technology aspects around, you know, having, having you know, immutable and resilient and tamper-proof data and trust boundaries and, and yeah. so on and so forth. They're all important, don't get me wrong. They're, they're super important. They're required. Um but when you think about how this really impacts a post-trade process, and we can pick on FX settlements because that's sort of, you know, obviously the right subject matter for this conversation. If you think about that, I mean, first of all, the value of having a single source of truth yeah. rather than having, you know, each party, as is conventionally the case, each party has its own, its own uh, you know, books and records, of course, um, which they maintain. And then when any event takes place, there's a need to then reconcile those books and records with your counterparties. So when I say any event, you know, you enter into a transaction, you need to match. Okay, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, then you agree, hopefully, that you're going to net those transactions. You need to agree what those netting sets look like. Yeah. Then you're going to settle. Great. You know, everybody wants to settle. So you then have to reconcile what probably the, the, you know, the day after value did those settlements take place and so on and so forth. And so because you're running these separate, separate uh, sets of data, which is, you know, the way everything's operated, you know, since, since the day dot, you've got all of these sort of processes that have to hang around that slow things down, frankly, you know, that discourage 
firms from doing things like netting. As I've said in, in previous conversations with you, you know that the amount yeah. of netting isn't done because of the operational burden is, is, is quite scary. And then you've got also the opportunity to run what we call sort of collaborative workflows. So because you have nodes, that's the way we describe them, nodes on the distributed ledger, and those nodes are sharing in that, in that single source of truth, they can also share in workflows. Uh, and those workflows can then be run um, collaboratively, if you will, um, and that's what can then automate and systematize and, and get the whole process much cleaner, much more robust, much faster than is otherwise the case. So you mentioned there, um, you know, working on nodes and the collaborative process. Can you give me an example of how this would work? For example, if I was you know, a Baton user and my processes for settling FX trades were actually different. I had another step in the process yeah, that's, to, that's, that's to my great, counterparty. Great question. And actually, that's, that's, that's really interesting that you asked that. So, so a lot of the time, let's take a step back. A lot of the time when we're talking to people, they sort of conflate blockchain with distributed ledger. Actually, some people then conflate Bitcoin with blockchain with distributed ledger. So, so you know, sort of take a step back from that. But, um, you know, a, a blockchain, one of the attributes of blockchain is, is that um, all of the or both parties, but all of the parties to the transactions need to follow exactly the same steps. Yeah? And, and that can be a challenge uh, because as we know, particularly when you're working with legacy, um, you know, processes that have been around for a while, as you say, quite rightly, different firms have, may have different internal processes. So, so what's really interesting in the way that we've designed and, and, and deployed our solution is that we provide in these workflows that I mentioned earlier, we provide for public steps and private steps. So the public steps, right. you know, we will match the trade. We will agree the settlement. Uh, you know, the, the, we will agree how we net. We'll agree actually when we settle. We'll agree, you know, to, to do the settlement and confirm that the settlement is done. Those are sort of public steps. But then behind the scenes, you can have private steps um, where one party may have an additional approval that is required. If a let's make an make an example, if a um, if if a, it's a certain currency that that has a a settlement amount of greater than a certain size, it may need to be flagged out to somebody for their you know for their release yeah. or whatever else it may be. Yeah, um, and those private steps can be built in, and so that gives that sort of combination, I guess, of of public side shared consistency and automation, whilst allowing still on the private side internal uh, the ability to have your own steps and processes. Um, and, and frankly, handoffs and handbacks uh, to and from, you know, internal systems and processes that you that you still run. So we speak a lot about the operational benefits here, and, and I'm sure there's more we can add on that. But obviously, being an old front office person, I'd like to know where these things are going to change my old job, for instance. I, yeah. If you're looking in terms of like, you know, how it changes workflow processes, yeah. in the front office what does this mean to like you know to the business yeah yeah so it's interesting isn't it and, and first a reflection on the fact that i think that i do think that sort of uh that divide between front office and then middle and back office is is one that's that's disappearing slightly it's blurring that boundary yeah you know, front office people are becoming increasingly aware of the fact that to some extent they are constrained by the operational processes that their bank runs and therefore they have an incentive to help alleviate those operational sort of pain points that exist and so you know if you can do some simple things like if you can eliminate settlement risk on a greater proportion of your transactions because you can operate the bat on pvp process for example which we have in core fx then you can face more counterparties for larger transaction sizes for example yeah so your, your, you know, your ability to service your franchise looks better. You can do so in a way where you're not consuming valuable settlement lines. And so those settlement lines can be redeployed for other products that probably have a higher yield than cash FX. Yeah? You can predict from a treasury and funding perspective, you can predict what your cash flows are going to look like through the bat on settlement, which is you know, timed and, and, in re and, and done sort of immediately if you will when the time trigger is hit you can predict what your cash flows are going to look like for that segment of the flow um, which is helpful that allows you to manage your buffers and your funding more effectively but then on top of that you can also because you have the ability to settle if you choose to instantaneously um, you, you can also respond 
to any shortfalls or, or frankly any surpluses that you may have in your in your account balances much more effectively and without taking on settlement risk with certainty of delivery so you can manage those buffers so your funding costs yeah. come down yeah so these are some examples these things really do so, translate to the performance of the business so there is an op there is a, an optimal um oh, sorry an optional aspect to this as in you can choose to settle in sustainably, but actually, if it doesn't suit your business, and you know, for yeah. instance, your trading style, you can actually make that like, what any time. Yeah, so this is really important. Actually, it's one of the things that I think sometimes I struggle to get across. So, thank you for asking that question. The 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 normal process, the normal process for firms that are using that on is that they will, you know, they'll net up all the transactions that they can possibly net. And they'll settle those transactions, of course, on value date by definition. Yeah. And they'll settle them probably according to some sort of time trigger. So let's settle our euro starting yeah. at 9 a.m. Central European time. And everything that's been booked up until 8.59 and 59 seconds gets included in the netting set, you know, get, gets the calculation, the, 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 the yeah. values are calculated and the parties settle those, those amounts. And they don't need to be cross-checking with one another because they're running a common calculation based on common configurations on common data. So that's all nice and easy. Yeah. But then, as you rightly say, Colin, if you have a transaction that you want to settle gross, okay, take it out of the netting set, settle it when you want to. If you have a transaction that you've just booked today and it's for funding purposes and you want to settle it right now, yeah, you can yeah. even put a time field, for example, into the settlement. So it was basically what we're running a smart workflows. Yeah. So you can put a time trigger into that and, and it can be for immediate settlement or it can be for settlement at some point later in the day. Okay, um, and, and the smart workflow will operate again collaboratively across the, the parties to the transaction. And so that does give you that flexibility. Yeah, so effectively, I mean, my first ever trade was an overnight cable trade, probably for about a million pounds or something, which is like, you know, truly- It was a million guineas, wasn't it? <laughs> it probably was actually, it was florins. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously that was the shortest possible trade that yeah. we could do for, for decades. Mm. Um, but now you're talking intraday swaps, aren't you? Well, so, I mean, I think, you know, we hear a bit about people looking at intraday swaps. I think that's an, yeah. an interesting, provides an interesting alternative for people who are on the, the sort of treasury desks rather than the, rather than just relying on the cash market. It gives, them, it gives them something else to sort of look at. And the ability to, you know, I think one of the challenges around intraday swaps has been the ability to, to settle safely and reliably and transparent, transparently and quickly. Um, you know, you, you want those funds in your account or out of your account, you know, as soon as possible, often yeah. even nearly, yeah? And so, yeah, I think that's a really exciting opportunity. And I think it's one that we're really well set up to do. And let's remember this, not just for the sort of the major currencies, but because of our structure with our rule book and the sort of, if you will, the simplicity for us to get, uh, you know, incremental currency approvals. This can be done not only for the majors, but also for, for you know, the, the more widely traded and frankly, you know, pretty much all of the deliverable currencies. Yeah. Um, and that becomes then an opportunity because it's those currencies where although the notionals are not so large, funding becomes a, a real challenge. You know, accessing liquidity and, and responding to uh, you know, to funding requirements is a real challenge. And, and in reality, I guess, yeah, when, when the BIS flagged this in 2019, you know, what they were seeing in the data, yeah. um, a lot of it was away from, you know, G3, G5, G7. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's so, right. Actually so, look, empower, so it would empower emerging markets, I guess, and developing markets. Yeah, and I think also when you when you look at the uh, when you look at the um, you know the challenges that that FX businesses have, you know, if you're if you're a, if you're trading sort of you know G seven, then you know you sort of you're never really worried. There are costs, but as a as a trader, you know everything just sort of falls through and, and liquidity is managed by. You know, you look at these guys on the EM, on the EM desks, and they really have like sort of real time problems. It's a bit like the difference between trading commodities, you know, in a sort of futures market or trading physical, where you know you're worried about will the boat arrive at the harbour and will there be the right crane to to offload the product, whatever it may be. I mean that that sort of difference is it's really interesting, and so so bringing that sort of level of of efficiency into the into the sort of the, the, the non G7, non G10 yeah. currency, something that I think really can help the market tremendously. Mm. On that positive note, Alex, we'll end. I mean, I've no doubt we will be talking again because I do think this is a very okay. important subject. And I think it's, and it's actually one that's evolving right in front of our eyes, which I think is quite fascinating as more and more people chip in and more studies are done. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. So thank you for your time today. 
um, and for explaining to this old spot trader exactly how some of this stuff works. Well, that's my pleasure, Colin. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll be back again soon.